find where we find our, our God at is is not one that has sat from the beginning of the universe and gone through every person that was ever going to be created and said, Heaven, heaven, hell, 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 heaven, heaven, hell. Th- that that is that is the entire premise of predestination. And the reason that we're spending so much time on this is because that is what Romans 8 is used to defend more often than just about anything else outside of verse 28 being used around graduation time. That is what Romans 8 is used for. And so when we see that that's the way some people um, take this verse, um, I would very openly, very easily argue they would misconstrue these verses, is, is knowing that our, our salvation is something that is uh, is a choice of our own. It is something that God, he foreknew that that would happen. That doesn't mean that he determined who would be saved and who would not be saved. And when we talk about the fact that he is the one that set us free, that's the only conclusion that I can come to in light of the fact that none of us can save ourselves. None of us can do anything to save ourselves. So in response, God is a, is a responsive God. The same way that in Genesis 3, He responded to humanity's sin, right? He does the exact same thing with us, 1 Peter 3, 21. When we reach out to Him, when we send that plea out to Him for salvation uh, through baptism, that, that He responds. He's a responsive God that whenever we send that plea out, um, He responds um, by, by saving. And He's the one doing the work. I'm just the one making the plea for help Um, but that doesn't mean that he's gone through and and chosen beforehand I hope all that makes sense Um, then we get into into verse uh, 22 for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now Um, and so this verse for the most part I'm only for our purposes is only going to be used as further reference that beyond a shadow of a doubt he's referencing genesis 3 paul paul's making sure that anyone reading this any any jew with any background in their in their torah in their first five books of the old testament knew exactly what he was referencing because if we look back at genesis 3 verse 14 what is one of the first parts of god's pronouncement women will have increased pain in child in childbearing and so when he talks about the the pains of childbirth um, until the present time he's kind of he's using that phrase pains of childbirth as like a a um, term for everything that we find from that verses like uh, what did I say, 14 to 20, that entire judgment that God pronounces in Genesis 3. Kind of in the same way that, this is a horrible illustration, but I'll use it as is. Um, instead of calling them tissues, we call all tissues Kleenexes. There might be 75 different brands of them out there, but every one I see, hey, can I have a Kleenex, right? Because that's just one specific one. That's the staple one. That's the one everybody knows, right? In the same way, looking at God's judgment in Genesis chapter 3, one of the ones that everybody would have known and everybody would have been able to recognize was the, the pains of childbirth. So he uses that to to include all of these other parts of Genesis chapter 3, like the working from the sweat of your brow, um, the, the earth in and of itself, as you're trying to cultivate, it's going to work against you with thorns and thistles so on and so forth you might ask how do you know that my only response would be show of hands how many fathers in here have felt and experienced pain in giving birth to a child none exactly so it has to be if all of creation is experiencing this um, then it has to be something greater right it's just referencing all that within Genesis chapter 3 so um, where does this bring us and where does this this lead us is all this is is building up to him making a point. Um, Paul never just talks for the sake of talking, right? And so all of all of this this talk is making a point, and it's going to shine through here in verses twenty three through twenty five. Um, so not only the creation, but we ourselves who have first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so where we're, where we're at and where we're referencing right now in that part, uh, redemption of our bodies, is that while the rest of the world, the world is in, in, as a whole, even including us, is, is longing, is groaning for that day 
when it all comes together and it all makes sense. Where the things that have been unseen and the things that have been unknown and under, ununderstood by our finite minds finally clicks. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm longing for that day for things to all make sense again as, as much as y'all are. Um, and sorry, spoiler alert, it's not going to come in this life. But for a Christian... So we have, a, a, we have creation as a whole, but this little subset of us um, that, that have come to know God, this little subset of us that have become his, his people, have turned our lives over to him, even further than, than just that um, day of, of revelation that's talked about in verse 19 and 20, um, there is a, a longing to, to come to know God the full adoption as sons and the re- redemption of our bodies. If you remember back to last week, if you remember like back to last week, what verse was it? Um, we have in verse 15, we didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have what? Received a spirit of adoption as sons for which we cry, Abba, Father, and we reference, you know, Jesus in the garden. And so he's, he's building off of that to say we're longing for that day. We've been adopted as sons for the moment, right? We've been at sons and daughters. We've been adopted as God's children in the, in the moment for the, for the moment. But the adoption here is, is not the end of the story. What we're, what we're longing for, what we're waiting for, is the inheritance that comes at the end of life that is going to come, that Christ has, al- Christ has already died to pay the price of the inheritance. We are, we are longing for it, waiting for it in that day when we have this full adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so this is talking about the, uh, the second coming. It's talking about the resurrection. A lot of this is referenced in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, you know the song on the resurrection morning when the dead in Christ shall rise. Um, so he, is, he has um, this glory that he has painted for us. And he's gone through, and notice what he's done. He's, he's gone through, here's, here's all the bad, here's all the sin, here's all the futility, here's everything you have to get to, to get to this glory that's waiting, this glory in Christ's resurrection that's waiting, where we can share with him in heaven, share with him in his inheritance. And so, for in this hope, we were saved. Um, so I don't know, I don't know about y'all, um, but verse 24, if, if we weren't saved, if we didn't go into the waters of baptism with the hope of rising again the same way Christ did to be with God for all of eternity, um, then, then we have some evaluating to do, right? We have some, some heart checking to do um, and some things to think about because the, the hope that we had when we made that decision, the hope that we had when we turned everything over to Christ was to be able to, to rise the same way he did, to have a resurrection body the same way he did and experience the same glory um, that, that he will that, that God is waiting to, to give us and then notice notice though he likes to to tie things um, full circle when he says for uh, for in for in this hope we were saved now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees for if we hope uh, for what we do not see we wait for it with patience and so he brings out this key, uh, everything is building towards and everything is um, like the, the, the mountain peak of this little passage that we just read is, is hope helps us to endure, or hope helps us to, to maintain patience because the rest of the world around us is going to be in this, this uh, futility spot, is going to be in this uh, purposelessness spot, is going to be in this sinful spot. And so... He, Paul paints the picture of where the Romans are at is this is only temporary and this more or less is something that we this life is something that we have to bear the troubles of this life is something that we we bear through the storm we batten down the hatches for the amount of short amount of time that we're here because when that storm passes what's coming on the other side of it is so much greater um, than whatever troubles or trials we might be experiencing in the moment and so with that um, we we it, it flashes forward to heaven, makes us think of think of what we're waiting for in in that. All right, flipping to the next section, we're doing great. We might actually make it. Um, we get to some spirit talk when we get to verse twenty six, and this is the part. This is the section um, that I love. This is the section Roman eight uh, Romans eight twenty six through like thirty 
goes so well with, um, with John 14 as well as John 16. It's the most explicit description that we have of, of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a note taker in your Bible, without a doubt, I would put um, at least the end of John 16 as a little footnote um, and, and vice versa so that we have, that's the bulk of what we have of just uh, Jesus and or Paul just talking about the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says, and we'll read, I will read 26 and 27 together. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we pray for as we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. All right, quick question. Have you ever had somebody speak or go on your behalf before and then say something that you would have never endorsed? Where you might see this sometimes, you're thinking of like big moments where people make proclamations on your behalf. Um, and that's, that's not always what I'm talking about. What I think of when I think of this is, have you ever sent somebody to a fast food drive through for you before and they have brought back something wrong or brought back something that is not at all what you ordered or you said no tomatoes or no pickles and it is covered in all that mess. Um, if you haven't had that happen before, bless you. I've had it happen to me about a thousand times it feels like. But when we have somebody that might go on our behalf, right, and we, we, tell, them, we tell them what, you know, here's what we want, here's what we're thinking, and then they come back and they bring us something that is totally different. Now this is where it takes a little bit of thinking. In prayer, we do that to ourselves sometimes. And I know that it's a whole lot um, probably deeper and more mature than the McDonald's drive through But in a lot of ways, when it comes to our own prayer life, when it comes to us pouring out to God, there are a lot of times where, just to be honest, Cameron gets in Cameron's own way. And there's a lot of times where whether we know it or not, we get in our own way when it comes to, when it comes to talking to God. And what he's telling us, and this is all in direct reference to this hope of heaven that we've just gotten, gotten done talking about, is that very literally, very actually, that the Spirit, the way that it helps us in our weakness, it says that it prays for us even when we don't pray as we ought. It prays on our behalf in a way um, that, that we might not even be able to put it in words. We might not even be able to put um, our needs or our, what we're going through into words. But, but God's Spirit knows and understands mainly because uh, Acts 2.38, He's in us, He's with us, He walks with us, He knows us, and He understands us on that level. And I hope that's encouraging. But I also want us to see in verse 27 something very special that you might be asking to yourself, well, well somebody, somebody's talking on my behalf or somebody's praying on my behalf well i want to know what he's saying that's that is fair i would want to know that too um i don't want to say that and us get the picture that that uh the holy spirit goes before god on our behalf with just ramblings of whatever he's decided to talk to god about for us for that day that 27 clears that up for us where it says and he he being god he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, what? According to the will of God. And so this, well, the way, uh, a big part of the way that the Spirit intercedes for us in prayer is even when we aren't, um, well just to be frank, even when we aren't mature enough in a situation to pray God's will be done, even if God's will is something that I would hate. I don't know if you've been there before, but I've been there before. I want, I am the, this is, we don't have time for this. I'm going to do it anyway. I am a control person. Like, the, the way that I see it in my, and it's personal, personality flaw. The way that I see it in my head that it needs to happen is without a doubt the best way for it to happen. And any other option is preposterous and should be thrown out the window immediately. And this shines through a whole lot um, when it comes to making decisions as a married couple. And it doesn't go well for me. But what I want us to see, and what I want, want, um, want you to see, what I want us to know is that when it comes to, to being able to set ourselves aside in prayer and pray for God's will to be done. It is, it is in, those, in those moments when it's hard for us. 
And in those moments where I, I see it in my head, God, if you would just listen to me and say yes to this prayer and make it all happen the way that I have it planned out, the world would be fixed. If you would just listen every now and again, you know, we, we, we act that. We wouldn't admit it. We wouldn't admit it in here. But we get, we get to praying, and we act that way sometimes. And what this is saying is that God's Spirit within us in those, in those moments that, what did it say? Our own weakness, when our own weakness is shining through, God's Spirit is there to pray on our behalf. What? According to the will of God. That even, even when I'm not in a spot and even when I'm not in a position that is mature enough to ask God's will be done no matter what, that I have someone there. I have God's own personal presence, God's own spirit, uh, his pneuma, that's the, the Greek word that is there for me to pray for those things that, that I'm, I'm too weak to um, and to make sense of the things that I can't even make sense of. And so that's one of my favorite parts of, of Romans 8 is seeing that and knowing that and understanding that um, because there's a lot of times that, that people let uh, feelings of inadequacy stand between them and their relationship with God. Um, people maybe even outside that don't don't think about the thought of ever ever coming to church because I just don't feel adequate. Well, a big part of what God does and a big part of what God promises is is I've got your inadequacy and I have my son Christ. Or I even, I have your inadequacy and I have me myself here standing as God and there's always going to be a gap and that's what Christ was sent for. That's what his spirit that he left behind, John 16, the spirit, the helper that he leaves behind after Christ has left this world was left to fill fill that gap and fill that void and this is just one of the specific ways that he does that okay um, verse 28 so we see we're talking about the spirit and then we get in to one of the most quoted verses of of all romans time romans 8 28 you see it you hear it typically around around graduations time graduation time also with that uh, verse from jeremiah taken taken out, taken out of context um so verse 28 and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And for those who are called according to his purpose. And it's a, a beautiful thought and it's a reassuring thought. Um, but I don't want us to see it this way. I do want to clear, clear this up. Um, is that I don't want us to read that verse and for us to hear it as Paul saying. Because again, it would be easy to take it this way if we walked up to our Romans tree and cherry picked this verse out and just read it for what it said. To say, alright, so little Johnny, if you... If you love God, if you say you love God, and little Johnny, if you, you know, if you go to church and if you even, you know, attended youth events when you were younger and, and maybe, you know, you might, you might do a scripture reading or two when you get older, little Johnny, if you'll, if you'll just do that, then I promise you, Romans 8, 28, it's all going to work out for you. It's all going to fall into place. It's all going to make a line. The puzzle pieces are going to lay one after another. You are going to be fruitful and successful and have the best life ever. Why? Because you love God, little Johnny. And I think that sometimes that might be, that might be how, we, how we read it and it might be how we take it when in all reality what Paul is, is building off of and what Paul is working towards is a context of what suffering <laughs> what he the entire reason he's talking right now is telling them of a coming hope and a coming glory why because for the moment and for the time being on this earth in this time there's going to be suffering romans um and the the concept of suffering doesn't doesn't stop with paul here and so in all reality i guess the way that that um it might be more direct to take this take this verse in paul's um, meaning and intention given the context i'm not going to tell paul what paul means i'm just going to bring in the rest of the context to help us understand this verse a little bit better that, that what he what he's saying here is that we know for for those who love god all things work together for good um maybe something something more to the effect um that for for those for those who love god um there will always be an avenue for god to be glorified and for those those who who desire and chase after him, because that's what love would would lead to, is a desire to chase after him. Um, that that in the end, uh, his his will can and will be will be completed. And so, if we're called to his purpose, that's the end of this verse. So, if we're called to his purpose, that's some of the things that that we work towards uh, is bringing about his will, which we know from you know Second Peter three nine. That's all humanity uh, is is to be saved. So. 
I guess bringing bringing that full circle, it's probably not a best witches. It's all going to work out. It's all going to work together for you as much as it is that for those who are longing after God, there are going to be opportunities and He will be glorified. Um, that His purposes will be done. And even that we'll benefit from that spiritually. We'll grow from that. We'll bear fruit from that. And, and there will be this final glorification, verses 18 through 25, that comes out of that. That's the good that he's talking about. I think too often we just hear good and we think earthly good when Paul's talking about a heavenly good, if that makes any sense at all. And so wrapping up, I'm out of time, but we're doing 29 and 30. Um, so for those uh, who, he, who, who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who he, whom he justified, he also glorified. Okay, so that was like a, a chain of if he does this and this and this and this. Um, I will get through it super quickly and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll have a week for it to marinate and then we'll come back and start off with it next week and maybe you might have some questions, which that's perfect. He uses the word predestined. God foreknew and he predestined. Okay, there's two different ways that that can be taken. The first one is individual predestination. The second one is a corporate predestination. Um, the individual predestination, which I do not, and I don't believe that Paul nor Christ advocates for is predestining from the very beginning these individuals no matter what they do heaven, 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 heaven these individuals no matter what they do hell, 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 hell we don't see it anywhere else in scripture but when we talk about a corporate predestination that would mean that humanity as a whole from the very beginning of time God has predestined I, I completely agree that God predestines God has predestined a plan for humanity to have the opportunity to come to know him and to be his people God has always wanted uh, his own people and we see that through the four different four different test trials that God made three of them didn't work one did first one Eden already talked about it failed miserably didn't last long only two people were able to able to make it out then we have well maybe, maybe that's a discussion for a different time then we have have the law of the patriarchs the laws of, of abraham isaac jacob didn't work either didn't make it out because god was building towards the law of moses which the entire book of romans is here to tell us is null and void and then we get to the law of christ god from the very beginning has predestined not this person, this person, this person, no matter what they do, go to heaven. And this person, this person, this person, no matter what they do, go to hell. But instead, has predestined from the beginning, corporately, for all of us, that humanity has an opportunity to come to know, with, know Him, be in heaven, and be with Him. Thank you. We're done. We're, we're, we are, we're done, and we'll let the hoodlums, hoodlums come in now. Um, it has been a good study. Hope to see you back next week.
scare everybody out this evening. If you want to mark a songbook, 546 is a song of invitation. Um, after after Mike brings us a, a quick message, as far as our sick list goes, we have quite a few still. It seems like some make it off, some graduate the sick list back to health, and then we always have, have new ones to fill the spots. So uh, Finley Minchie, that is the granddaughter of Roger and Brenda, has seen, from what I heard, has been having some problems with strep throat, and so is going to have tonsils removed uh, Thursday, that is tomorrow, so please be keeping them in, in our prayers. Uh, Miss Shirley Adkins, that's Laura Adkins' mom, is still in, um, in, in Sumner with her recovery uh, with her uh, rehabilitation that's the word that I was looking for and when I when I went and talked to her she was seeing three different therapists a day for different things and so hopefully um, we'll be brought brought back to uh, to to fight and shape again and so uh, Jim Farley is also on our on our prayer list if you would um, please keep the them in in our prayers as far as our corona update for the church the Millers are still out and so um, Maddie has a week left on her quarantine. Um, Brittany and Rick and Tracy are are green lighted, but are staying obviously staying home with with Maddie for for that reason quarantining with her. So hopefully, um, no symptoms will be present when that week's over and they'll be back to society again. Um, the Dennises are in the the same boat. Paisley Dennis, uh, that's been doing good. Christy, hard time. And Cody, you'd have to ask him. Just drive by Polston's. If he's working tomorrow, then you know he's good. If not, I doubt he's working. That's just a joke. Um, thanks. And so then we have uh, Nastia Fry. That's Philip and Trina's niece that is still working through um, her, her complications with, with bones and surgeries and that rod breaking and everything else. And we have Miss, uh, Miss Regina's cousin uh, Ruth Ann Raglan is in Orlando, Florida, going to be having a pretty big procedure coming up here soon, as well as um, uh, Philip Fry's aunt Rebecca Groves has re recently had a surgery on her head, a lot of stitches, sounds pretty serious, so I'm sure they would appreciate our, our prayers, and then... Um, Bethany Fry is at home right now waiting for a test. She has a fever, waiting for the test to come back. And as I referenced in class, one of the few times that we can ever say we've prayed for a sinus infection. So hopefully it doesn't come back positive for COVID. And then we said a, a special prayer on behalf of, of Kyle Turner. I'm going to assume that uh, a lot of y'all know him better better than I do since he uh, is a county worker. And from my understanding of the situation a week and a half ago, um, he was doing, doing well. He was thumbs up on the up and up. And as of this evening, he is on ECMO, which is the machine that operates your bodily functions for you, keeps you alive for you, and so that is um, that's pretty pretty scary um, to see, you know, with our with our own community and with people that that we know. So if you could, please keep them uh, in in our prayers. So th I think that's it for a uh, prayer list. Other than um, Miss Christy Dennis's aunt Joyce Spivey, Joyce Williams Spivey has has passed away, and. Um, she will be having services soon to be announced as as if they were announced they'd be on this paper um so please reach out to she's at anderson, she's at anderson and when will that funeral be friday. the funeral is friday all right right and with her with their quarantine she's not going to be able to get to go so that'd be a good one to reach out and call her text this week is, is christy dennis seems like she's got uh, quite a bit she's, she's going through getting hit with all at once um, as far as upcoming events the big ones the main ones we're still looking for elf tree participants we typically get those um, from making helps right but they're not doing that this year and so we're doing our best to um to do that in-house and forms went out in bulletins this Sunday for different individuals. This doesn't this doesn't have to be somebody from from church. This doesn't have to be something somebody that any of us have ever really met before. If you work in the the school system and you know a family that is is struggling but would never ask for help but would really appreciate it, fill out a form for them and we'll we'll help them out. If you know somebody from um, down the street that has recently 
lost a job for because of corona or whatever reason fill out a form for them and we'll help them we're, we're looking to keep our our numbers of people that we reach and touch as as high as normal and right now the list is is very low so let's not um let's think open open outside of the box when it comes to names for that um and even if you're not willing to take the stuff to them still fill it out and we'll we'll get somebody to to get that get that there um to them however so um, please fill one of those out. If you have any questions, see Mary Lou Pedigo. Then uh, Thanksgiving service will be as it has been in the past. We'll have a prayer service on Tuesday, November 24th, and that will be regular Wednesday night time just on Tuesday night. Um, guys, be looking for me to contact you for either a scripture reading or, or a prayer or a song, something of that nature. I know that that's always a beneficial time to uh, to focus our minds you know, on what we're thankful for. Then... Blood Mobile will be here November 30th from 1 to 5 if you would like to give blood. And then one last announcement outside of youth is on this Sunday was our past, this past Sunday was our first Sunday in the fellowship hall. We have opened up another area for, um, for members to, to be able to worship. And there is a, a hard line with the, the live stream ran over there. And the purpose of, of that being available uh, is one, we see how, how full we've been getting lately, and that's, that's a great problem to have. We hope that that continues and we continue to uh, gain our numbers back. But we also know that there are some, just, you know, being, being honest, we know there are some that haven't come back out of um, fear of the, the number of people that are in the auditorium or out of fear or the, the number of people who have, you know, made the autonomous decision not to wear masks. And so to try to, you know, to try to meet everybody's needs, um, we've set up that area for, for those that can have, have that, that zone where those are more consistent. There are less people. Those masks are being worn. And so that they might be, they can still get out and, and come to worship service because we know that for the most part, a lot of those people with, with those fears are people that might live alone or people that haven't gotten out and really had contact or seen people in the last seven months that need that, that just need that human contact and need to be together but aren't comfortable doing it with 170 people. So if you know of anybody that maybe fits that bill or fits in that boat, please let them know we have this, this available in the fellowship hall. Um, we're hoping to, uh, to, to grow those numbers over there as that will mean more of our church families coming back together, even if it's 20 feet apart, 25 feet apart. Um, as far as youth goes, the CYC sign-up list is posted in the foyer. As of right now, um, space is not limited. Space is full, but we're hoping to buy more tickets. Um, so please, if you're going to sign up for that, do that ASAP. Um, and also get your money to Kyle Searcy by December 2nd. He was talking pretty tough. He was breathing some threats against you if you didn't get him your money um, by December 2nd. So if you don't want to face the wrath of Kyle, I would do that. Um, there will be a youth devotional next Sunday p.m. after services, and that will be here at the refuge, at the Fellowship Hall, Ref out at the refuge so for uh, for our uh, junior high and high school uh, there will be a devo Sunday night after services in the refuge and I hope y'all are looking forward to that so that is all I have as a long list I'll turn it over to Mike <laughs> he said my quick message I'm not going to have a quick message <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to be reading Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. So they want to turn there. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for a day and sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing around in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go to work in my vineyard. I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three of the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked him, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owners of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them for the wages. Beginning with the last one, hired going to the first. The workers were the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received the denarius. So those came, so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received the denarius. And they received it and began to grumble against the landowner. These who were 
were hard lashed only one, these who were hard lashed worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have been borne the burden of the work of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want you to give you the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do so? Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with my money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Dale Hicks still here. Imagine Dale Hicks, who, his hands were working for him and, and, and the guy was roofing and he only roofed an hour late in the day and these other dudes had worked all day long. How would the scene be as his workers? Somebody say something. <laughs> Wouldn't it be happy? No. Does the story make any sense in that respect? No. Imagine this. Imagine at some point a young girl was born in this congregation at some point in time. Grew up to be 12 year old, was baptized as a Christian, lived her life, grew up, become a mother, had a family, raised Christian kids, taught Bible study, lived her life here, and died. How would she fit into this story already? Everybody agrees she would be one of the first workers. Okay. In the 1930s, there was a couple from Shakota, Oklahoma, that moved to Bakersfield, California, because in Shakota, uh, Oklahoma, in the early 30s, was after the Depression, no work. They moved to Bakersfield to work in the farming community. You that have never seen the story on TV about the Okies that lived in, in Bakersfield. What, have, what kind of life did Okies have in Bakersfield in the 1930s? Anybody know? They were considered the scum of the earth. So these folks, they had moved to Bakersfield to make a living farming. And by the way, this lady was a member of the Church of Christ. So they lived there, lived in tents. But later, uh, the man was able to, to move the family into an old train boxcar where they lived and continued to work. And then in 1937, this young couple, they had a son named Merle to come into their life and live with them in 1937. Time went along, Merle's father died when Merle was nine years old. And when Merle reached the age of 14, Merle became quite a singer, quite a guitar player. He also had lots of trouble with the law. He was in and out of trouble, in and out of penitentiaries until he was late teens. And at 20 years old, he ended up in San Quentin prison where he was still playing music and singing. There at San Quentin, Johnny Cash come and play, and he was impressed with Johnny Cash, and he wanted to be a country music singer. Of course, Merle's last name was Haggard. Merle Haggard went ahead and lived his life, uh, a honky-tonker and, and an ungodly life, his entire life. At, at, uh, when Merle Haggard was 75 years old, he rededicated his life to Christ at the Church of Christ in Austin, Texas, and died at the age of 80. How does this story fit Merle Haggard? So, this story is about God or Christ is open to everybody regardless of what state you're along as long as you're willing to do what? And as long as you're willing to open your heart to Christ. So tonight, if there's anybody here that needs any kind of help, or if you're ready to open your heart to Christ or need help anyway, you can come and just stand and pray.
sermon series on the unexpected package, so I'm looking forward to that. Are there any other announcements? Wonderful. If there's not, Brother Ansel, would you mind leading us in closing prayer? Sure, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just another good day that you've given us. For the opportunity to be back here tonight to worship you. Thank you for the lesson that we heard. Help us, Father, to do our best each day to follow you. God, just be with us as we leave. Keep us in your care. And bring us back to the next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.